And welcome to this week's show of Weighted Donuts. I'm Wayne Unger. My ho- co-host, Craig Steer, unfortunately couldn't make it tonight. He has pneumonia. But tonight we have a special guest. We have a uh, known author uh, who specializes in the subject of sports, business, and politics, and uh, the whole connection there. We have Evan Weiner. Evan, welcome to the show. Good to talk to you. How are you this evening, Wayne? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. So uh, I I was talking to a couple of friends of mine today, and, you know, uh, one of them said, oh, you know, you forgot to send me the link to last week's show, and and I apologized, and I told them, you know, that you were going to be on tonight and where the subject will probably lean. And the first question, he said, yeah. He says, ask him how badly we're getting screwed with City Field and Yankee Stadium. So I, I'm like, okay. <laughs> now, well, well you know, in, and, in, which, in which way? I mean, if you're a customer or if you're a fan or if you're a taxpayer. Um, you know, I have an owner. I, I, would, I, would, th- I would think mostly in, in the context uh uh, of a taxpayer, we know we're getting screwed as fans, so, you know, and we do our best to buffer it, my, you know, my, myself, uh, you know, I bring snacks in a clear plastic bag so security will let me in, I buy a bottle of water, and uh, I eat either before or after the game, I do the best I can, you know, to keep them from getting me, but, uh, but ta- I mean, tax-wise, I mean, these were supposedly team finance stadiums, but... We know they really weren't completely, but maybe not even a majority of it. I'm, I'm guessing that we'll, you know, we'll be we're lucky if uh, if we only paid for half the bill. So well, enlighten us a little bit. You know, yes, the Yankees and Mets put up money for a stadium, and uh, a lot of the Mets money comes from City, uh, as in City Field, as in taxpayers bailing out what was a toxic bank, and uh, yet the Mets get $20 million a year out of it. Uh, By the way, the Brooklyn Nets, New York Islanders, and Barclays Bank, uh, Barclays doesn't have any real dealings in the United States with the exception of um, the arena in Brooklyn. And I'm going to throw that in because uh, it's all part and parcel, and you've got to take it all together. Um, Listen, going back, in 1990, and uh, this is even more than the Mets and Yankees. Uh, I did a TV show many years ago, and it's up on YouTube right now. Uh, if you look it up uh, and look through my videos, you'll find the TV show. And in 1990, Major League Baseball and Minor League Baseball came up with a player development deal where basically Major League Baseball told every city in the United States, you either improve your minor league stadium uh, or build a new one. And Mario Cuomo spent $60 million in the 1990s to fix up stadiums or build new stadiums. Uh, the one in Buffalo didn't come under that one. The one in Buffalo came in the late 1980s. And Glens Falls, New York, used to have a team, and the lighting wasn't all that good, and Glens Falls decided not to put money in there, and they moved that team to Sussex County, New Jersey. So when you talk about New York State, and talk about all these stadiums and all the arenas. New York State is giving the Buffalo Bills a couple million dollars a year, I guess for maintenance, uh, if for nothing else. But they're getting partially paid to play football in Orch- Orchard Park, New York. Um, the arena in Buffalo was uh, financed partially by New York State. Uh, you go right through Rochester, Syracuse, uh, Binghamton. Um, all of that came under the 1990 Major League Baseball, uh, Minor League Baseball Agreement. Um, and then you get to the city and the new stadium for the Yankees, the new stadium for the Mets, and the Brooklyn Arena. And they're all kind of gadgets. And I can't even begin to explain how much money is going here, how much goes into the Yankee Stadium parking lot, how much property tax is not being paid, and I'll even go back even longer. I'll go back to the Mario Cuomo, Ed Koch days, 
when the Gulf and Western owned the garden, Madison Square Garden, and threatened to move the Knicks to the Nassau Coliseum and the Rangers over to the new arena in New Jersey unless they got some sort of tax breaks. And Ed Koch, Ed Koch, the voice of reason, Ed Koch, the fiscal watchdog, fiscal watchdog, decided to go to the New York State Legislature and ask for a property tax break on Madison Square Garden. And at that point, it was about six, seven million dollars a year. This is 1982. The state legislature approved. Cuomo signed it. And all of a sudden, Madison Square Garden is taking off the tax rolls. Uh, back now 34 years and the tax would probably be up around 14 million now so you're probably talking about madison square garden not being on the tax rolls um you're probably talking uh let's say conservatively um maybe 300 million dollars not paid to the city so when you come up with formulas uh the yankees and the mets uh, $300 million from the city and state and infrastructure, which means that roads have to be fixed up, sewer lines, power lines, the whole bit. Um, the Mets and Yankees, as far as I can tell, are in the same boat as uh, Madison Square Garden in Brooklyn and not paying any property tax. But, you know, this is not a New York problem. If you take all of the teams in the NHL and the NBA, all of them, together paying property tax you will find that all of them pay less property tax than the ottawa senators or the montreal canadians uh, canada doesn't have the same deal and montreal and ottawa actually are paying property taxes uh, in texas uh george w bush they got the deal when they got the stadium built or approved for building in the early 1990s whereby they got 77 acres of land around the stadium, which were never developed. And a special tax district was created within the stadium perimeter, which meant instead of taxes going to Arlington to pay off the bond uh, on the stadium, it, it went to the Rangers owners because the Rangers owners put up one-third of the money of that stadium and they're collecting taxes to get the money back. And there's a complicated deal in Arlington for a new stadium for the Rangers, uh, which allegedly is a 50-50 split between Arlington. They were going to raise sales tax and or keep the sales tax that Jerry Jones has, providing that people say yes in the November referendum. But they were also going to have a special tax district, which means that $300 million collected in taxes on the grounds of the baseball stadium will go into the Rangers' pocket. So instead of paying $500 million for the stadium, they're only paying $200 million. So you've got to really look at the fine print. And even when you look at the fine print, you don't even know what you're paying. Now, does how much of a dent does sales tax uh, make as far as getting some of the money back uh, and not only sales tax, uh, jobs, income taxes, you know, from, from, the, pe- from the people that actually have to pay taxes, uh, does, does that make any kind of dent? Does it, does it really do anything as far as giving back to the economy? No, not really. Um, the overall, if you take in New York City, the Mets, Yankees, Nets, Islanders, Rangers, Knicks, Liberty, and throw in some other events at the Brooklyn Arena or the Garden. Um, I guess the Mets kind of have concerts, but they're after games, and the Yankees, uh, of course, have the soccer team. And uh, basically, uh, on the overall economy of the city, it's negligible. There's really nothing that it really adds all that much because you, know, you don't have people flocking uh, into New York from out of town. Now, uh, there were two events from out of town that actually make a lot of money. Uh, one is the Belmont, especially during a Triple Crown year, because there were a lot of people who do come to New York for that. And the other is the Marathon. And I think what the Marathon's up to about 40,000 runners. And of the 40,000 runners, what, 25,000 come from out of town. So they're looking for hotels here. And the 25,000 runners generally 
aren't just 25,000 runners. They're more like 45 to 50,000 people using hotel rooms, um, using restaurants. So actually, and, and the city just blocks off the streets, pays overtime for the cops, overtime for sanitation. And um, they actually make money on that event. That's an event that makes money. Coney Island, Nathan Hot, Hot Dogs, even though there aren't very many people there, that kind of makes a little money over there, more than what Nathan's would normally do uh, on a day-to-day basis. Uh, again, you've got to look into all this stuff. I mean, if you're sitting in, in New York City, you're paying for Buffalo's Arena and Buffalo Stadium. Um, and uh, there are a lot of stadiums in the New York Penn League as well uh, that you paid for over the years. So it's, it's a lot of money. It's, it's billions of dollars. Um, not all at once, but certainly year after year after year. Um, yeah, they do collect tax, payroll tax from Mets and Yankees players uh, in terms of state tax, which Florida doesn't, Texas doesn't. But the jobs that are created aren't very good jobs. I mean, um, they're basically vendors in arenas and stadiums, per diem workers, parking lot attendants. Um, when Jay Cross was trying to get a New York Jets stadium built on 34th Street and 30th Street between uh, 12th Avenue and 11th Avenue, he let out something that probably he shouldn't have. Now, Jay Cross helped get the Miami arena built. He was up here trying to get a Jets arena built uh, or Jets stadium built, and even the Giants at some point couldn't do it. But he, he said basically, look, these new stadiums, they're good for the owners. They're good for the players. They're good for parking lot attendance. So in terms of the overall economy, if you have a hockey team, a visiting team comes in six times a month. Um, same with basketball. Uh, although when you got uh, three hockey teams and two basketball teams, that may be less. And um, the hockey teams, um, the Islanders and Rangers, don't, I mean, they play in New York City, but they practice in Westchester and in Nassau County. That's where the pay, players get paid. So they pay the taxes there. Um, they come to the city, um, and it's only six times a year. And so, you know, there may be a dinner the night before, maybe breakfast, out to the rink, and then out to the airport. Although, in some cities, there's the Michael Jordan tax, where cities, and New York is one of them, they do take sales tax out of performers who perform here. Right. Now, uh, so let me, so uh, before uh, Giuliani left office, he had a deal in place that uh, Michael Bloomberg kiboshed uh, to build two new stadiums. Was 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 Giuliani's proposed deal worse than the deal that we ended up with with City Field and, and the New Yankee Stadium? As far as yeah, when I say did. worse, I mean, I mean, did, did we make out better at least financially with Michael Bloomberg's uh, with the stadiums that were built when uh, Michael it, Bloomberg was in the office? It, it, it's hard to tell. I mean, it, it's very hard to tell because it, we never did get the details, the real details from Giuliani. Giuliani did build two stadiums. One in Staten Island, which is the most expensive minor league park, or to that time, the most expensive minor league park ever built because it was built on a toxic uh, waste dump, and uh, the one in Brooklyn. So um, there were two stadiums actually built for baseball during the Giuliani years. There was also the renovation and the improvements at uh, the tennis center, uh, which actually brings money in. I forgot that uh, because people from all over the world come in to watch that tournament. So, uh, and uh, anyway, there's, you know, they got the 99-year lease over with the tennis center. It's a sweetheart deal and all that other stuff. The bottom line is sports owners. The sports owners do not pay full taxes on all this stuff. Right. It's it's funny. Go ahead. I, I was going to say it's funny what you said about the Staten Island Yankee Stadium being a toxic 
uh, used to be a dump. I, I, I live on Staten Island. I've been here since 95, and uh, for the first two years I commuted to the city, and the Staten, where the Staten Island Yankee Stadium is now, it used to be the parking lot where I used to park my car up next to the ferry every day. So I had I had no idea that that was once a dump. Uh, I know, you know, the dumps that are further at the other end, you know, that were at the other end of the island. But uh, I didn't know that that was a dump over there as well, so close to the ferry. It's right next to the ferry. Yeah, it's got one but, of the great views, one of the great baseball views. Uh, oh, it's beautiful. It, yeah. It's beautiful. So, yeah, and they're changing uh, now, the nickname. Yes, they are. They, yes, they're getting rid of it. Yes, there's, 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 uh, it's, it's been a little buzz around here as far as, you know, uh, what to name it. Uh, but, you know, which I, I think, I think it's good. I don't, I don't, you know, this, I think it'll give it, uh, a more local identity. Uh, and, and, cause attendance really has not been the greatest. Uh, you know, the Brooklyn Cyclones do much better in attendance, and uh, the Staten Island Yankee Stadium, people don't realize how easy it really is to get to. I mean, you just get down to South Ferry, you, you, you take the ferry over, it's free, and boom, you, you, you walk right into the stadium just about. I think, I think part of it is the Mets actively promote Brooklyn. Um, and because they own the team, whereas the Yankees have an agreement to have a team there. Uh, and I think that's the difference. The Yankees really, I don't think the Yankees give the, the minor league team there all that much thought, um, whereas the Mets do. And the Mets actually send injured players to Brooklyn. They own the team in Brooklyn. And that's another stadium that uh, they probably aren't paying property tax on. Right. So. And, oh, and uh, you know, the, the other, the other property- I, the other thing I forgot, I forgot, the New York Cosmos are still looking for a stadium. And they're looking at um, Belmont Park for a stadium. Wow. That's, so we forgot about that. So there's a lot of stuff going on, an awful lot of stuff going on. And then there's the Mark Messier thing up in um, uh, the Bronx over at uh, the old Kingsbridge Armory that um, the city at this point uh, and Messier's people have not come to an agreement yet on putting in, I believe it's nine ice rinks and making it a skating center. Uh, so um, you got that as well going on in the city and, and a fight over the money and taxes and all that other stuff. So uh, that thing is still percolating in the Bronx. Now, let, let me ask a friend of mine wanted me to ask you uh, about Nassau Coliseum. Was yeah. was it a mistake by the people in Nassau to uh, to vote against re, you know building a new a new Coliseum? Well, here, here's the deal: Nassau County has the highest property taxes, and given that it's has the highest property taxes, which which it does. Uh, the people are taxed out there, and there's also, you see, nobody wants to talk about this because nobody wants to discuss what really goes on and what you need uh, in terms of what you need to have a successful franchise. And what it is is what David Stern told me many, many, many years ago. And you need three things. And I'm going to ask you. You know, I, and when I when I talk to college kids, I ask them the same question: What's the most important thing you need for a, a successful franchise? And I get various answers. If you want to come up with one, you're probably going to be wrong, but uh, I'll, I'll let you come up with one if you want to. Uh, successful franchise? Well, uh, well, for one, you you know, I would think you need to win. I, I, I just lost you. I said I would think for one, for one you, you know, you need a team that, that, that wins. I mean, we know you can't win every year, but you need a, you need a team to be successful on the field. Nah. Nope. Okay. As a, nah. No, it's, you need government. 
you need government to help build the plant or build the ranch. And then once you get government money into your plant or ranch, the second thing you need is a local large cable TV deal. And cable TV has been regulated by the government since 1984 with the tax code of 19 – and that's the tax code with table, a cable TV act, which basically socialized cable TV in that uh, there was a basic expanded tier. And uh, in those days, CNN, MTV, uh, WTBS, uh, ESPN all ended up there. They were all losing a lot of money, and they kind of socialized all that, put them all on the tier, which you pay for. You don't have a choice of what's on the tier. Uh, you take either all of it or none of it, and you don't get to see how much money you're paying, like $6 a month for ESPN or Five dollars a month for Madison Square Garden, or or the Yes Network, another five bucks, or SNY, another five bucks. So you don't get to see how much you're actually paying for all this stuff. Uh, or Fox uh, News Channel, which is a buck, or CNN, which I think is still around fifty cents, and TNT is about a dollar twenty-eight. But you don't know that because they don't want you to know that under the provisions of the 1984 tax code. And then, on top of that, you want corporate support. You don't want fans. You want customers, because customers will spend money. Fans won't spend money. Like you said, you bring your food there. Um, you're a guy who they lose money on. They want the people who go to the restaurants where who will drop money and then take it off as a, as a deduction, a business tax, tax deduction, which means they're only paying about 50 cents on the dollar for whatever dollars that they're spending. I, ah, so they hate me. Well, that's okay. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't say hate. They want you in front of the TV. Um, yes. They want you in they front want, of the TV. They, they, they want me in front you. of the TV so they can register me as a viewer and so they can, ra- so they can get more money for advertising. Well, so the cable companies can get more money for advertising, which yeah, will in turn cable, increase their cable revenue. Yeah, but but see, the way it's broken down is they get 88 cents or something like that on the dollar for every dollar they take in uh, from subscribers, and the other 12 cents or so is from advertising. Ratings mean nothing in cable TV. You hear about ratings all the time, but they, they don't. They don't mean anything. You know, the ratings are a 1950s era uh, standard. And um, look, with mobile devices today where uh, video on demand, all that other stuff, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. Um, I guess it matters to sports writers who don't understand how the business has totally changed. You know, it used to be teams got a lot of money from radio. I mean, CBS itself was put up 117 stations for sale. Nobody wanted to buy them. So now they're going to put out stock to see if they could keep the stations or keep them basically um, in in the family, so to speak. And um, that's the way it is. Now, let me ask you, getting back to – Texas, and and even Atlanta, they have a new stadium. I think it's supposed to be completed and ready for next year. Yeah, in Cobb County. Yeah, in Cobb County. So, now, though, now I mean, the, the, right now, Arlington Stadium, it's only around 22, how, how many years old? Is it, what, 20? Uh, it's 22? 22 years old. Okay. Uh, the Atlanta Stadium is even newer. Now, granted, I understand that it was, you know, originally built for the Olympics, but I mean, we're talking 20 years. How do they how do they pull off? How do they sell it to the public? You know, stadium 20 something years. Oh, but we need a new one. How do they pull that off? Uh, it's pretty simple. The politicians wanted, you know, the stadiums in uh, Pittsburgh. And in Seattle in the 1990s were built after voters said no. In Washington State, the legislature overruled the voters, came up with a stadium plan. And basically uh, the same thing happened 
uh, in Pittsburgh has also happened in a couple other cities uh, as well. Charlotte, um, voters said no to an arena. Uh, and the politicians say, hey, we know better. We certainly know better. And we're going to do what we're going to do. Uh, and they did. And uh, politicians, see, you got to understand one thing about sports and, and politicians. The guys who are behind sports are basically the money guys behind candidates. Um, Eddie Einhorn and uh, John McCain in Arizona is, is one example. Um, the Dolans uh, basically owned the Republican Party in Nassau and Suffolk County. Um, and um, whenever they needed something, um, they um, hired a former politician uh, at Cablevision, and the politician, of course, was friends with whoever was around, and they were able to cut deals. Um, and so, yeah, you you look at you know you you look at all that, and it's all politically connected. Um, Jerry Jones is friends with Bill Clinton, and you have seen uh, Chris Christie uh, embrace Jerry Jones. Uh, and the funny part about that is, of course, Chris Christie is on the Port Authority with Andrew Cuomo, and uh, Jerry Jones' company got the concessions uh, for the Port Authority. Yeah, I wonder how that worked out. <laughs> So, yeah, I yeah. mean, I mean, yeah, it it goes back to the follow the money, uh, of course. Yeah, um, you know, and uh, so, you know, you, you go follow the money, and um, and that's how it basically is. I mean, you know, look, these guys, you know, a guy like Fred Wilpon is partners with Bernie Madoff. You know, is that in the best interest of baseball that Fred Wilpon, who is now the head of the financial committee in baseball, who has twice been victimized by Ponzi schemes. Yeah, I mean, he, he's a member of the club, and he's a real estate developer in New York and is highly connected, and everybody likes him. So uh, even though he should have been thrown out of the game. So, hey, they, they threw George Steinbrand out of the game, and he came back, right? This is true. Well, you know what? That that's, uh, I've said this many times. Uh, you know, on my show, because we talk about the Yankees a lot. My co-host and I are both Yankee fans. And I always say that Howie Spira should have gotten uh, a ring every year between, you know, 96 and 2000. Uh, every year, the year, the four years that they won the World Series, they, he should have gotten a ring because if George Steinbrenner was not out of baseball for those years. You think, you really, might, you really think. You really think George was out of baseball? Well, you really think he was? Yeah, yeah, I got a bridge to sell you if you think he was out of baseball. Okay. Well, to to a certain to a certain extent, he wasn't. Let's, just let's think, put it this way: he wasn't in the office on a day to day basis, but he was with the okay. U.S. Olympic Committee at the same time. So you know, uh, he you know they basically let stick Gene Michael run the the team. And um, and so um, yeah, so that um, yeah that that was um, that was yeah he he did, uh, but he he was not. Uh, let's put it this way, he his money was still invested in the team. So how could you throw him out when his money is invested? Well, his money was invested, but you know there was a, a notable a noticeable difference. Uh, in in tr in let's say the trading pattern, okay, yeah. you know there wouldn't, okay, and, and and that was huge, that was huge. You, you know, mean, you mean you mean you didn't have Frank Costanza talking to Jerry Seinfeld, George Stein brother, saying how could you trade uh, Jay Buner for Ken Phelps? Exactly. You, you, you know you did you know you didn't you trade you know Seinfeld, yeah. I you I do you did it with. You didn't, you know, you didn't trade, uh, you know, you didn't trade Gita. You didn't, you know, you, you, I mean, you hung, you hung on to Bernie Williams. Uh, you, you know, you, you, hung, you hung on to players. You let them develop. You, you let the team suck for a few years. And uh, I don't think if George Steinbrenner was fully active with the team, I don't think that would have happened. Well, the team was I'm in not, a spiral by that point anyway. When, 
Because I remember the day that he was uh, allegedly thrown out of baseball because we were running around Manhattan that day getting man-in-the-street interviews, and, yeah, George is gone, uh, but George was never gone. In fact, he came back in the baseball. There was no announcement that he came back in the baseball, remember. He just came back. That was after Faye Vincent was thrown out. Well, but, how, however, you know, however it worked out, whether, whether George had a change of heart or whatever it was, I was, I was quite grateful over those years because the 80s, uh, you see, I mean, you got to understand, I've been a Yankee fan since 61. So, I, you know, I, here it was, I, you know, I'm treated to one of the greatest teams of all time. Uh, and even another World Series victory and a couple of visits to the World Series after that. And then, you know, all of a sudden the team is old with no minor league system. And, uh, you know, 69, I, I believe they were in last place. I mean, it was... Oh, 66 you know, it was, they were in last. Yeah, 66 so, okay. they were in last. So, I mean, so. it was just, so, you know, I, but I, you know, but it was, I, I enjoy seeing the team come back to life. I, you know, I, I just like, uh, well, I'll give you another example. I was an Islander fan when, you know, when they first came to town. And watching yep. that team being built piece by piece was just, I mean, it was. I can't tell you how gratifying it was as as a sports fan. So uh, you know, uh, the eighties, yeah, the no, the eighties were, were were a tough time to, for for me to be a Yankee no. fan because they made the stupidest trades, the dumbest signings. It was, you know, and and, and actually, uh, even last the last, last decade. Trying to put together a rotisserie team, I gotta say, I, I, you know, it was frustrating for me because I'm saying they're missing the mark. You, it's it's got to be a blend. It's got to be a blend. I mean, if you look at the, you know, those great Yankee teams from me, even though they didn't win the series in 2001, you go from '96 to 2001, it was a perfect blend of stars and part-time players, deep bullpens, role players. It, it was beautiful. But go ahead, I'm sorry. What you were, you were about to go on? No, I was going to say, as an Islander fan, what you probably don't remember or don't realize is how close that came that team came to folding. Um, thank you. Oh no, I, I do remember. Yeah. They, thank you to Engulf Endeavor or Engulf and Western. Um, you know, this is this is classic sports. Um, in the 19 19- of course, the Nassau Coliseum is, go- is going to be built and is built. And the New Jersey American, American Basketball Association team ends up in, on the island, and Roy Bow ends up buying it. And Roy never had any money, but in those days, you didn't need that kind of money to run a, a team. And anyway, so Roy Bow actually gets to move to the Nassau Coliseum, And the WHA comes along, and the NHL and Madison Square Garden in particular uh, doesn't want to see the WHA on Long Island. And they go to Roy Bow, and Roy Bow is in the American Basketball Association, but they say, hey, look, can you do us a favor, and, you know, we'll pay you back at some point. Take the National Hockey League expansion team in Uniondale, which he does. Well, the NBA – merges with the ABA in 1976. And the Nets have to pay, or Roy Bow has to pay, $3.2 million entry fee. Doesn't get a part of the TV deal for about five years. And meanwhile, the, the Silner family in New Jersey, who had owned the St. Louis team, took four-sevenths of the TV money that the NBA had in perpetuity. That was a uh, deal that was cut by their lawyer, not Dave DeBusher, who was the ABA commissioner at the time. And basically, okay, Bo has paid $3.2 million, but now the Garden is saying we want $3 million because you invaded our territory after they begged him to get the team in Nassau, the Islanders, to keep the WHA out, and that's how they repay them. And, of course, he had to uh, sell Julius Irving off, and he had no money, and they were borrowing money from the Islanders. And the Islanders nearly sold Dennis Potvin to the Boston Bruins for about $4 million uh, in 1978 to keep the team afloat. John Pickett stepped in 
and uh, along with Chuck Dolan, uh, who had uh, Sports Channel at the time. And you got to understand, one thing about the Islanders being on Sports Channel is that Dolan accepted the fact he was going to lose money, but he could say to the people who were franchising, who were handing out the franchises, look, um, I got Sports Channel, I got News 12, so are you going to keep me as the cable franchisee? Or are you going to get somebody else and they won't be able to get Sports Channel with the Islanders or the uh, News 12 Long Island? So he used that as a loss leader, and they saved the franchise. And then Pickett, about 1985, starts taking the money out of the Islanders from the TV deal, which was quite lucrative at that point because he has a new girlfriend, and the girlfriend basically says, hey, John, you know, why are you investing that kind of money in a hockey team? when you can invest it on me. And the players all knew it. Pat LaFontaine got traded because of that. So did Brent Sutter because they all knew it, that um, the Islanders had ceased being a hockey team, and the money that was going into the hockey team was going for middle-aged Pickett's 22-year-old girlfriend. Wow. Uh, hey, and, you know what? The, I never that, knew that. that that's good. That sport, if you ever try to figure out – now, subsequently, Pickett signs a really horrible deal to stay on the island for 30 years in 1985. It's a terrible deal. He gave away a lot of money. In 1986, the tax code has changed in the United States, and after that there's a whole bunch of renovation and building of new arenas and stadiums because under the right set of circumstances, an owner can get 92 cents out of every dollar raised ticket sales, concession, et cetera, inside an arena, and uh, the public will get $0.08 cents back. And that $0.08 cents would go to pay down the debt of the arena or stadium, but that couldn't pay down the debt of the arena or stadium, so they had to raise other taxes or have municipal layoffs or cutbacks in services. And, and pick, it, pick the wrong year to sign a 30-year contract renewal had he waited – Say two years, but, you know, his girlfriend couldn't wait two years. But if if he waited two years, uh, they would have had a much better deal and perhaps stayed out in the island. Except the problem the island is um, Grumman moved, a lot of other companies moved out, and uh, corporate-wise, as the game went to corporatization, Long Island was left behind. They're in Brooklyn. They're fine in Brooklyn, no matter what people say. Uh, they're getting three to four times the revenues in Brooklyn as they could on the island simply because, A, there were no companies. They didn't have the luxury boxes in the Nassau Coliseum. They got the boxes in Brooklyn. Uh, somebody is cutting checks, whether they're getting $50 million from, from the arena or whatever they're getting, and it's a much better deal. They, they can finally act like a New York market team which doesn't make the New York Post too happy, or Larry Brooks, who works for Rupert Murdoch, who owns 10% of Madison Square Garden and 10% of the Rangers. Ah, you got, you got, you ah, you you see, you, you follow, you follow the trail. You got the trail. And, uh, you know, and that's, and that's why we have you here tonight. Uh, Tell me something. Uh, Baseball, Going international. Do you see that? Yes. Well, they are international uh, right now in Toronto. They well, when I said, uh, well, are, are they, do you think they're going to go beyond, do you think they're going to go beyond Toronto? No. I mean, okay. you know, they, you know, maybe Mexico, but, you know, it's, uh, you know. Um, but in terms of where can they go for expansion? Uh, Montreal would be a good place, except um, they don't have a stadium, uh, and the Canadian dollar is depressed. That's why Quebec City didn't get into uh, the NHL in this recent expansion. Um, They like Monterey. They've always liked Monterey. They're not going to San Juan. Um, They basically run out of cities in North America that could support it. Uh, Where would they go? Tokyo? Well, they're not going to go to Asia, and they can't go to Europe because they don't have – anything established in Europe, um, and they're not going to South America. So, um, you know, they 
could always go to New Jersey. But uh, Stu Sternberg, who is the owner of the Tampa Bay Rays, told me that um, baseball is kind of soured on New Jersey since the New Jersey Nets situation. Uh, the Nets always had problems over there in terms of selling corporates, whatever. Of course, they never had a really good team there either, except for the couple of years that Jason Kidd was there. Um, so, anyway, um, when you look at where to go, I mean, Southern California, I suppose, might be, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe, uh, you know, certainly not, they're certainly not going to go for a third team in Chicago with Milwaukee that close. Um, San Jose, they, because the Giants control the territory, um, they won't let Oakland uh, move to San Jose. So, yeah, they're really stuck. I mean, yeah, you look, Charlotte's not in, in Major League Baseball City. Too many games. Las Vegas isn't. Um, San Antonio isn't. Portland, Oregon isn't. Um, so where do you go? I mean, Montreal would seem to be a likely city. There's a lot of money in Vancouver now. It's Chinese money, and baseball in China uh, is – is in an embryonic state. Um, the NBA went to uh, Vancouver partly because Hong Kong was closing in 1999, and they thought they were going to get uh, uh, the Hong Kong money uh, to into um, Vancouver, and and it was just, it was a bad deal all around in Vancouver. Um, Arthur Griffiths, who bought the NHL team or had the NHL team and wanted to, uh, the NBA team in the new arena, leverage themselves out because unlike the United States where somebody will pay for the arena, uh, he had to pay for it himself, and it ultimately ended him as the owner of the Canucks, the Grizzlies, and the arena. And uh, Vancouver's ownership has been a mess since uh, the Griffiths days, and, and of course the Grizzlies uh, ended up in Memphis. Speaking of Tampa Bay, I mean, the, I, w- I was actually, uh, I was there in April. I went, you know, I was in Orlando. We took a ride to Tampa for the day, and we caught a game there. And, uh, I mean, I, I personally, like, I, listen, I, I, prefer, I prefer games outside, but it, I was comfortable. It certainly was like, it, it wasn't like being at City Field at Yankee Stadium, but at least I didn't have unobstructed views, and I didn't pay an arm and a leg, but uh, it was like the people People ask me about it, and I tell them, I say, well, I say, have you ever been inside, like, one of these, like, indoor tennis bubbles that we have here? I go, that's what it felt like. It felt like being in an indoor tennis bubble, but the game itself was great. I mean, I didn't, you know, to me, the game itself didn't skip a beat, but do you think ultimately that they're going to have to move from Tampa at all? Well, that was another stupid thing that uh, happened there. Uh, back in the late 1980s, uh, Peter Ubroth told the people in St. Petersburg, don't build the building. Uh, they went ahead and did. They built the building. Um, and that became the home of the Tampa Bay Lightning eventually. Um, in terms of the team going there in St. Petersburg, they, they really had no choice after a while because baseball was sued uh, by a local car dealership there, uh, a dealer there, and um, uh, they eventually lost uh, baseball. But um, they gave this team to, um, oh, I can't even think of his name, Morsani was the car dealership, and uh, I could see Namoli, Vince Manoli in front of me. They gave him the team, and he served. A, he signed a 30-year lease. He signed a 30-year lease. Baseball at that point was telling everybody, sign 20-year leases. He signed a 30-year lease. And so that's why they're stuck there. Um, will they move? They should be over the where the money is in Tampa. Uh, the money is not in St. Petersburg. But, um, hey. That's where they are, and um, they still have 11 years left on that contract, uh, and they've been trying to negotiate out. They haven't been able to negotiate out. Um, Stu told me that um, 
they're hoping that they'll be able to continue to negotiate out. And uh, it takes about uh, five years to put together a stadium, uh, two to three to plan it, and then two years to build it. And so he's hoping at some point that uh, he'll be able to build it, and um, they'll stay there. But they want to be on the other side of the bay. They don't want to be um, in St. Petersburg. Yeah. They want to be on the Tampa side where the, the money is. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's what I was told by uh, my oldest son who lives in Orlando said, you know, the toughest thing about, you know, uh, well, one of the toughest things is you have to go to Tampa to get to St. Petersburg. And he said, he said Tampa traffic is horrendous. He's, it's, yeah, that- he said it's really bad. Now, I also read somewhere that in a couple of years, uh, the the price of the lease goes down or something. So at that point, yeah. like, they can consider basically eating it, so to speak, where it, it wouldn't become as, uh, you know, it wouldn't be as exorbitant, you know, an expense as it would to do it now. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the law of diminishing returns kicks in. Um, they still have 11 years on the lease, but every year that you get closer to the end of that lease, uh, it's going to be worth less and less and less. And, you know, you've got a stadium that, let's see, that stadium is, what, 24, 25 years old now? And by the end of the lease, it'll be about 36 years old. And you brought said, don't build it, and they built it. And um, they had seven teams at one point that wanted to move there, including the Texas Rangers, the Minnesota Twins, the San Francisco Giants, Seattle Mariners. I heard Kansas City at one point was uh, was in that, that mix as well. So uh, they had a lot in Minnesota, Minnesota Twins. Um, and they finally got the expansion team. Well, and, uh, you know, well, talk about, you know, those other teams that wanted to move there, you know. You talk about the best moves are the ones you don't make. So, uh, well, San Francisco wanted to get out of Candlestick Park, and Seattle wanted to get out of the Kingdom, and uh, Minnesota wanted to get out of um, the dome that they were in up there, and, uh, George Bush's people used uh, St. Petersburg as leverage to get a new stadium in Arlington. And, um, yeah, it's, it's business, and that's what it is. It's business. It's, you know, uh, to, to fans, it's a game. Um, it's a business. And um, I think that, um, you know, I've been able to draw the line between the game and business simply because I was thrusted into that, covering a baseball strike, covering a football strike, the NBA, salary cap, drug uh, agreement. Um, there was a baseball strike in 85. There was football strike in 87. And then uh, I had the USFL, NFL uh, antitrust case that I covered every day. So, you know, I learned a lot. Um, you know, I got a probably a doctorate school of hard knocks uh, learning about how the business operates, and you know, look, I have the best teachers going, and Pete Rosell and Peter Uberoth and David Stern and Gary Bettman and John Ziegler, uh, and um, I wouldn't say Bart Giamani because Bart was a bully, um, and, and Faye Vincent was thoroughly incompetent, um, as was Bud Selig, and baseball somehow has endured despite the fact that their leadership was thoroughly incompetent. Um, Paul Tagliabue didn't say all that much um, and um, certainly David Stern uh, who I learned a lot from uh, and then Don Fear and Marvin Miller uh, from that side of the business along with Larry Fleischman and, uh, or Larry Fleischer I should say um, and it just goes on and on and on I mean I, I learned from the very best because I was with them every day and interviewing them every day and they sat there and they explained everything to me. Uh, and it's all about, as George Young once told me, he said, look, he said, I'll tell you this. He said, you show me a player who says he'll play for nothing, and I will show you a liar. It's all about the money. Right. Now, speaking about players, <clears throat> excuse me, and money, because before, 
before we wrap this up, I, one thing I wanted to ask, uh, I believe in two years uh, the uh, the agreement between the players and, and the Major League uh, is up. Uh, no, it's up, kind after, of... it's up after the up after the season. This season, okay. Yeah. Uh, what 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 changes do you see uh, coming up as far as uh, or do you see changes in drug testing? Do you see changes in the way free agency is handled? Uh, no, I, I know mean, we've seen a lot. No, no. I, I think what, what you're looking at, what you right now is that. You know, as Herb Brooks once said to me, uh, if it ain't broke, uh, if it ain't broken, why fix it? And right now, there's so much money coming in on both sides. I mean, there are probably minor issues that they want to clean up, but the major issue is always money. And baseball doesn't have a salary cap, but they got uh, revenue sharing, and um, so the owners may want to tighten that up a bit. Uh, but other than that. Um, I don't see many changes. I mean, the basketball is up next year, um, and I'm sure the owners are going to want to clamp down and really tighten up the salary cap. Uh, Kevin Durant, the way um, that went down uh, in terms of him taking a shorter contract to form a super team. They don't like super teams per se. Um, But I'll tell you one thing about Durant is that um, Kevin played by the rules. Kevin decided that uh, he was going to make a business decision, which he did, and uh, he fulfilled his contract. He did everything that Oklahoma City demanded of him for his contract. He made a decision. Unlike his former boss, Clayton Bennett, who bought the Seattle Supersonics uh, back in about 2006 from Howard Schultz, Schultz couldn't get a new arena in Seattle for the Supersonics. Supersonics Arena was redone in 1995. Uh, he couldn't get a new arena. Schultz sells it to Bennett. Bennett tries to get an arena and leaves Seattle with two years left on his contract. He basically broke the contract, negotiated out of the contract, and uh, moved his team to Oklahoma City. So he didn't fulfill his contractual obligations in Seattle Durant did in Oklahoma City, and he made the same decision that his former owner made back in uh, 2008. So all these people are criticizing Kevin Durant. Hey, they don't live his life. This is what he wants to do, and he's an entertainer, and he's an independent contractor. He doesn't belong to the fans. Fans don't own him. If he breaks down tomorrow, he's fine money-wise. But if he breaks down tomorrow, the fans are going to forget him. It's like Matt Harvey. Matt Harvey is broken down. If he can't pitch anymore or if he's gone within two, three years, you know, Mets fans are going to say, okay, turn the page, there's somebody else here. That's how sports is. Of course. What about sabermetrics? Are, are you into sabermetrics at all? Uh, no, you know, it's, it's funny, you know, given, you know, I – started covering this thing in 78, the old-timers, hey, they just went up there and they just played. They played, they played hard, they played for fun. They didn't worry about, well, this guy should be standing here or that guy should be standing here or they or Corsi or whatever the other sabermetric stuff was. They went out and they played. And, you know, when it gets down to the level of seven-year-olds playing Little League, which I think is going to happen eventually, it's a game. Go out and have fun. I mean, you know, if you if you watch the NHL, the NHL used to be Montreal Canadiens wide open, uh, Edmonton Oilers wide open. The Edmonton Oilers style was stolen, as Glenn Saver once told me, from the uh, Anders Hedberg, Ulf Nielsen, Bobby Hull, Lars Eric Jober Jets, which was just go, go, go. And now it's just – it's tedious to watch a lot of games because – when the team gets up one nothing, it's just smothering and smothering and smothering. And I think a lot of it is so much money involved. Nobody wants to make a mistake. And also characters have been weeded out. And now you get, you know, the geeks who are calling all the shots instead of playing the thing naturally. Go out there and play the way you're supposed to play. 
you know, and, and don't, you know, in, in my opinion, you know, don't tie up a player because he's, you know, on, on a Wednesday when it's 83 degrees and the wind is blowing from left field from the north at 12 miles an hour with gusts up to 14, he can't hit a curveball. Right. Well, I, I don't. I don't think. I don't think sabermetrics go that deep. Uh, you know. But I, no, mean, I mean, I, I, I listen. I, I understand your point, and uh, you know. I mean, I, I listen. I, I believe that uh, a, a good marriage can be made of uh, secondary statistics and and the eyeball. I, I think a really good marriage can be made of that. Uh, we've had uh, Dan Zimborski on a couple of times. He's uh, he, he's a columnist for ESPN.com. He's very he's known for his zip projections. He's you know, and and I, and I asked him and I, I go you know what about the eyeball test? He goes absolutely. He goes and you know he goes like you always you always have to take that into consideration. So but I, I tell you, uh, I mean. Quite frankly, I, I you know I, I I personally think they 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 have their place. I know sports analytics have crept into all the sports, but you know where I'm most familiar with them is in baseball. They have their place, but I certainly believe you know you you you, you got to You also got to you got to marry it with the eyeball. That that's my yeah, I mean, my you know, personal opinion you, on it. You look you look at Maddox and Glavin, right? Could Maddox and Glavin break his pane of glass? You know, hey, well, let's, let's get no. Let's get let's get the guys who throw you know who throw real hard all the time. Most of those guys who throw real hard all the time end up breaking down. Oh, I I agree, but you know, I tell you something. Uh, I I I watched a lot of Braves games because. You know, we get TBS here, and, and and the Braves were always on TBS. And for me, it's like I, I don't, you know, even though I'm a Yankee fan, I I, I can watch a game, or I can watch a game, and I would I would all, you know, I would always be flipping around. I, maybe, maybe it's just perception, and it was definitely more so Glavin than Maddox. Uh, but I I felt as though the umpires love those two pitchers. I know I uh, particularly with Tom Glavin. I never I never saw a, a pitcher ever get more strikes on balls out on you know balls outside off the plate than Tom Glavin. It was just it was it was just unbelievable. So well, you know you but, you got to work the you got to work the umpires, and that's part you do you do as Yogi uh, as Yogi as Yogi once told me. He said, "If you ain't if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying." There you go. There you go. So you know, so um, you know, there's a lot of cheating that goes on in baseball and or, and in all sports, and it's it's it, it's not cheating. Cheating, it's you know, kind of like uh, you know, a wink and here you do the wink and all that. Um, but there's a lot of cheating that goes on, and and it's. You know, Elston Howard used to take the baseballs. Uh, after oh, yeah, on his shin guards, of course. Yeah. Uh, Elston, li- listen, I don't know if you caught on, but the name of the show is Weighted Donuts. Yeah, yeah. But and that. and that's because, uh, you know, when I was a kid, uh, I, I don't know I don't know how old you are, and I'm not going to ask you, but oh, uh, back. I'm, I'm you're 60. 60 years old. I've been around forever, so. Okay, well, I'm sixty. I'm sixty-one, so I got a year on you. So, uh, if you remember, of course, everybody remembers Sunday, Sonny Fox and Wonderama. That was on yeah, I was Sunday. With Sonny, yeah, I was with Sonny Fox about three years ago when he was eighty-seven okay. years old, and 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 as he said, the uh, United States at that point, I believe, was uh, two hundred thirty-one years old. So he said, no, it was two hundred and seventy-one years old. And he said that uh, I have lived one third of the life of America at that point. <laughs> well, Sonny Fox used to have a show also on on Saturday called Just, Just for, fun. for Fun, 
And I happened to be on that show, somebody in my class, they were having a birthday, and they got, like, you know, a strip of tickets and took some of us, and that was, like, the birthday thing. They must have, so, they must have known somebody on the inside, because it's the only way people got tickets. I, I honestly, that, I have no idea. I have no that, idea. Uh, but the show, the show that I was on... Uh, Elston Howard was uh, made a guest appearance, and I was picked. They used to have a little baseball contest sometimes, and, and basically it was like a pitching machine with wiffle balls. And so that was the year Elston won the MVP, and it was quite early in the year. It was probably around May. And Sonny Fox says, yeah, you know, you're having a great year, Elston. You know, there's even talk about you as an MVP candidate. And I go, he'll win it. And Sonny Fox he turns did. around. He did. Of course he did. And yep. Sonny Fox turns around and was like, oh, who do we have here? And, you know, and there was like, so I had my moment, you know, with Sonny Fox and Elston Howard and yada, yada, yada. And, of course, I mean, he was one of my favorite players then, but, of course, that, you know, that deepened the bond. So, uh, anyway, so because of, of that, when we had to come up with the name for the show, uh, my partner came up with weighted donuts, knowing my affinity for Elston Howard, and uh, so there you have it. So yes, I'm, I'm well aware of the uh, you know rub, rubbing the ball on the shin guards, so uh, yep. scratching the ball off with the shin guards. Absolutely, yep. absolutely. So Evan, I, I want to thank you for being on. I, I appreciate it. It was interesting. It was enlightening. And I'm sure that, you know, when my 15 or 20 listeners hear the show, uh, you know, it might actually be up to 25 now. Uh, there you go. You know, they, they, you know it, it, will op- it will open their eyes as well. So, yep. thank you. And, well, thank uh, you. Thanks for having me, and uh, we'll talk soon. You got it. Thank you. Have a good night, Evan. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.